Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Dean Paul Cleary, who regrettably is traveling today, let me welcome you to the Yale School of Public Health Centennial. This is a year-long centennial celebration, and I encourage you, by the way, to take a look at our website for all the activities that are on, on uh, being planned for the year. Today's talk, today's talk is the fifth, is the fifth in our year-long centennial Milbank uh, Public Health in the 21st Century series. The talk is given by our visiting, uh, a talk by a visit and a visit by our distinguished guest, the U.S. Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy. He is the fifth, this, as I said, the fifth, which uh, this Milbank series actually was made possible by a very generous, uh, the generosity of the Milbank Memorial Fund. <clears throat> Previous and future Milbank lectures are hosted by all the school's departments, thus ensuring a diverse examination of our challenges and opportunities for a broad spectrum of distinguished leaders in their fields. Today's lecture is hosted by our Department of Health Policy and Management. When CEA Winslow founded the Yale School of Public Health in 1915 as one of the first schools of public health in the country, he expanded the way we think about the determinants of health. And he became actively involved in improving the health in the city of New Haven, the state of Connecticut, and even globally. Winslow's vision served as a model for the creation of schools of public health throughout the country. And we have a running argument with some of our sister schools about which one was the first. Uh, at the Yale School of Public Health, we have a very rich history of extraordinary accomplishments in advancing the science of public health, in educating leaders in their fields and in translating our findings into innovative approaches to a variety of public health issues. Please continue to join us throughout the year as we honor, in a myriad of ways, Winslow's foresight, as well as all the Yale public health pioneers who have paved the way for us gathering here today and as we look ahead with a vision for improved health for all in the next hundred years. Innovation through collaboration, that, that's the theme of this centennial. And the work conducted in the Department of Health Policy and Management is an excellent example of novel interdisciplinary approaches that are needed to address the public health concerns that we face on a global scale. Speaking of interdisciplinary, I'd like to thank Drs. Uh, Howie Foreman and Zach Cooper and the entire support team who have made this extraordinary event possible. Dr. Foreman is Professor of Diagnostic Radiology, Public Health, Management, and Economics at Yale. He is also Director of the MD-MBA program at Yale, Faculty Director of the MBA for Executives, Leadership in Healthcare, and Director of the Yale School of Public Health, Healthcare Management program. Obviously, he does not have very much to do. Uh, Zach Cooper is an assistant professor of public health and health policy uh, and uh, economics at Yale. He is also a resident fellow at the school's Institution for Social and Behavioral Studies, or Social and Policy Studies. Zach will be moderating the question and answer period today uh, after Dr. Uh, Methy's uh, talk. President Salve, uh, I, I, well, I'm sorry, I am now honored to introduce um, the president of Yale University, Dr. Peter Salve, to welcome Dr. Murthy. Uh, Peter Salve, president, uh, is the Chris uh, Argyris Professor of Psychology. He served as provost at Yale from 2008 to 2013 before his appointment as president in 2013. He received his PhD in psychology from Yale as a member and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. He has received numerous awards and honorary degrees. His research interests are lie in the connection between human emotion and health behavior. The School of Public Health is proud to say that Peter holds a secondary appointment as a professor in the Department of Chronic Disease Epidemiology and the Social and Behavioral Sciences Division. He has played key roles in two of our major programs. They are the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS and the Cancer Prevention and Control Research Program. We are equally honored uh, to count his wife, Marta Moret, among our alumni. 
Uh, Martha uh, received her NPH here at Yale in the School of Public Health and is now very active in local and state public health organizations and in her connections to our school. Please join me now in welcoming uh, President Peter Salvec. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that introduction and uh, welcome everybody. It is great to be here on this special occasion. And uh, as you heard, uh, the uh, School of Public Health has uh, real emotional connections for me and for uh, Marta. I'm very proud of uh, being a part of the faculty and uh, have lectured in this room before. And uh, uh, also uh, that my lab, uh, back when it was going strong, was so connected to uh, research going on here in public health and many collaborations across uh, the uh, connector from the psychology department to the School of Public Health. Um, the Milbank uh, lectures are just one of the many ways in which we're marking the centennial uh, of the School of Public Health. And today really is kind of a jewel uh, in the crown of this uh, series. Uh, it's not uh, just a tremendous honor uh, to welcome the United States Surgeon General back to our campus, but it's, uh, but it's also an honor uh, that uh, uh, we're welcoming him now. There's a trend. He's been here multiple times, and we are welcoming him, uh, uh, not just welcoming him, but welcoming him uh, back. Uh, before I tell you a little bit about him, uh, I want to offer a few words of gratitude uh, to Professors Howard Foreman, to Zachary Cooper. Uh, they really made today's uh, session uh, possible, and uh, uh, we really thank you for setting up this extraordinary lecture. So thank you to Howie and to Zach. Um, our speaker, uh, Dr. Murthy, in a sense, uh, needs no introduction. Uh, I, that is a cliche often used when you have someone incredibly distinguished speaking, and I, I can only tell you that it often doesn't work. Um, <laughs> Many of you know uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger gave his papers to Yale University. And so he comes once or twice a year to give a lecture on this campus. And as president, I had the honor of introducing him. And I said, well, here is truly a man who needs no introduction. And uh, I hear this pounding on the stage with a cane. And it's Dr. Kissinger who's sitting on a chair on the stage, pounding his cane on the stage. And he looks over and he says, I don't do a very good Henry Kissinger imitation, but <laughs> so try to use your imagination. He says, uh, Dr. Uh, President Salve, I may be a man who needs no introduction, but I am also a man who enjoys listening to an introduction. <laughs> so, so now I still use the phrase, but it is meaningless. <laughs> You know, uh, the Surgeon General is America's doctor, and he's responsible for communicating health science information to the public, uh, to overseeing the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, and in general to protecting and advancing uh, the health and safety of uh, Americans across this country. Uh, his interest in public health is rooted in his earliest years when he spent time in his father's Miami Medical Clinic. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard, and in 2003, his MD and his MBA here at Yale, completed his residency training at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, where he later joined uh, its faculty. Um, he has devoted his life's work to improving public health through service, through clinical care, through research, education, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, and he uh, describes, I think you'll hear him talk a little bit about it, uh, his um, caring for patients has really a great privilege uh, in his life. He co-founded co Visions, which is an HIV AIDS education program in India and in the United States, uh, and the uh, uh, Sawasthya Project, uh, which uh, is a community health partnership in rural India that trains women to be health education uh, uh, providers. He's also a healthcare entrepreneur, as I mentioned, and an innovator. He co-founded and he chaired uh, Trial Networks, which is a software technology company that supports research collaboration and clinical trials. Uh, he served as the president of Doctors for America, a nonprofit organization focused on building high-quality, affordable healthcare systems. Uh, in his current appointment, 
Uh, he is working especially hard to build cross-sector sector partnerships that address uh, obesity, that address tobacco-related diseases, that reduce the stigma associated with mental illness, uh, that improve vaccination rates, uh, that establish health prevention, I'm, I'm sorry, that establish prevention and health promotion as the backbone of U.S. communities. So last year, I think many of you know, Dr. Murthy was the speaker at the School of Medicine's commencement exercises for the class of 2014. And we're very fortunate uh, that he has made the time uh, in his schedule to uh, rejoin us here at Yale again this year. But I have to add something important, because something critical has happened between these two uh, speaking opportunities uh, in his life. Um, uh, he, uh, he has not just had two speaking engagements, but he has, an, he has had an engagement of a different kind. Um, just last, mo last month, he was married to a fellow doctor, Alice Chen, uh, who also is connected uh, to Yale and to Morse College in particular. And uh, I thought we could take a moment and offer on behalf of Yale University and the Yale School of Public Health our heartfelt congratulations on this new stage in both of your uh, lives. Uh, with that, I am honored to welcome to this stage our Milbank uh, lecturer, Dr. Vivek Murthy. Well, thank you all so much for that incredibly warm welcome. Thank you, President Salove, uh, for hosting us here today. Uh, my thanks uh, to Associate Dean Lederer and to Dr. Foreman, who is not only somebody who helped bring this event together, but also a very uh, dear mentor uh, and personal friend of mine uh, who I've relied on for counsel since I was first a student here uh, way back when. So you know, thank you all for having me. And I also just want to say just how wonderful it is to be back at Yale. Coming to Yale feels like coming home in many ways. And I was telling uh, my aide, Lieutenant Anetta, who's here as well, that when we drove into New Haven last night, I felt this, uh, it's almost like I felt like a wave of ease just wash over me uh, because the, the memories I have here are, are rich, uh, they're wonderful, uh, and I was uh, really blessed uh, to be able to have some time here. Now, I spent five years here uh, shuttling between Cedar Street and Hill House Avenue, which was where the business school main campus uh, used to be before they got all big and fancy. You know. <laughs> but you know, th that time was spent learning in classrooms, but it was also spent meeting new people and exploring ideas. And I met lots of great people. Uh, and in fact, uh, only some of them held it against me that I attended a certain undergraduate institution in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> but generally, people were very welcoming. Uh, they were very kind, and, and they shared really of themselves. And it's for that reason that over time, Yale became more than a university, but it became a, a home to me. Uh, you know, it became a place where uh, people uh, not only gave me ideas, but where they encouraged me and supported me even when I doubted myself. Uh, and that has made all the difference in my life. Uh, so I will always be grateful to Yale for that uh, and always uh, happy, certainly, to come back. But the real beauty and the real power of Yale uh, is in the fact that each of us, uh, whether we're students or faculty members, has so many different stories that we can tell. Uh, it's the fact that each of you who are here are here for a reason. Uh, and that reason isn't who you are or where you're from or what your parents uh, may do for work. Uh, but you're here because you know that you are capable of accomplishing something. And you know in your heart that big changes have to happen to make health a resource for every individual and every community. Uh, and you also know that you have to play a role in making that a reality. When I was a student at Yale, I had no idea that I would become Surgeon General. Many times I didn't even know what I was doing the next day. <laughs> but what I did know is that I was very lucky to be here. Uh, my father was supposed to be a farmer in India. He was the son of a rural uh, farmer in South India. And for many years, he thought that's what he would do too, which is to cultivate rice, coconuts, mangoes, and tamarind, which is what they grew. Um, he was never supposed to become a doctor, and he certainly wasn't supposed to move to the United States and raise a family here. Um, but just a few decades ago, uh, it's conceivable that somebody who looked like me uh, could not have walked through doors of opportunity in our country and at this great university, much less the office of the Surgeon General. But times have changed, thankfully, for the better. 
And they've changed because of the hard work and passion of so many leaders who have come before us. And today, what I want to talk about is how we collectively can keep that change going in creating what I hope will be the golden age of public health. I want to talk about how each of us can ensure that public health is something uh, that is known by everyone, regardless of whether they're in the health sector or not, as a key foundation for our country. You and I know well that public health is really more than just an isolated field of study. It's more than something that sits in an ivory tower or at an isolated you know, department uh, of public health desk. It really is, in fact, and this is something I firmly believe, health is the fuel that powers everything in America. Uh, without health, we can't succeed in education. We can't succeed in economic development or in other fields of endeavor. Every part of our society, therefore, has a critical role to play in improving public health. But as public health leaders, it's our responsibility, it's our collective responsibility to help the world understand this. And in addition to being experts in data and analysis and in program uh, development and implementation, you also must be engineers uh, who can build bridges between various uh, disciplines and fields of study. You must also be masons, if you will, who lay the foundations for collaboration across sectors. And you must be translators who can help lawmakers and physicians and business leaders and educators develop a common language around health that we can use to advance it. And I want to be clear, I'm not just talking about the work that you will do in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. I'm actually talking about the work that you can do right now, whether you're a student or a faculty member. But, and this is because our country was really founded on a, a radical idea, radical at the time and even sometimes radical now. And that's the idea that anyone, regardless of your background or country of origin, could contribute and could make a difference in their own unique way. That fundamental value or set of values centered around fairness and equality and opportunity have been at the center of our country's best moments. And fighting over what those values meant and who they apply to has also been at the center of some of our country's worst moments. But today, we live in a unique moment uh, in history, a time when the combination of technology and knowledge have come together with breaking down barriers and this has made it possible for more people than ever before to play a role in improving the health of their communities. So that's why I want us to come together to create that golden age of public health. It's a time where different sectors can come together and both recognize and embrace, embrace the role that they can play in improving health. But it can only happen if we have leaders who articulate that kind of vision for health, because not everyone understands it. It can only happen if we have leaders who can help other sectors understand uh, that even if health is not in their title, they still have an important role to play in improving the health of their community. This is the time where we need not just established leaders uh, and experienced professors, but also young faculty and young students to step up and be part of this larger transformation in our country and around the world. And I say this to you not just because you are some of the brightest minds uh, of our generation, that you are, and that most of you know already. But I also say this because of the great urgency that's facing our country when it comes to public health. This is an urgency that I hear about every day when I visit communities as Surgeon General. And I'll tell you about some of them. You know, I hear from mayors and doctors everywhere I go about how the prescription opiate epidemic is ravaging small towns and big cities alike. I hear from parents about how addiction and mental illness are still seen by too many as moral failings rather than as chronic illnesses that deserve and need to be treated. I hear from teachers who are trying to figure out how to deal with e-cigarettes being used in their classrooms. And I hear from communities who are struggling with a crippling epidemic of obesity that we have that's affecting our kids and our adults. But most concerning to me is something that Dr. Salovey and I spoke about just a few minutes ago earlier this morning. What concerns me is the sense that I get from many that they have lost faith in their ability to improve their health. More and more when I talk to people in communities big and small, I sense that they feel that forces beyond their control are increasingly determining their health. Forces related to the food industry, insurance companies, hospitals, or other entities that have clout. In too many cases, I feel we have lost our agency when it comes to health. 
But there are also reasons to be hopeful. And I encounter these on the road each and every day. Like young, just yesterday, for example, I was in fact in Las Vegas. And I met this wonderful family, uh, a mother, a father, a daughter, and a son, who walked to school 1.7 miles each way every day. And they do that because they know that that's a way they can not only improve health, but they can also get some family time. You know, I also draw hope from programs that I encounter along the way, programs like the one I saw in Roanoke, Virginia, where the community is coming together to teach kids and parents alike about fruits and vegetables and how to use them to prepare healthy foods. And I also draw hope from programs like I just visited in Indiana last week, where law enforcement and public health and educators are coming together to build strategies to address the opiate epidemic, uh, which is taking its toll on Indiana. They are inspiring stories like this that are dotted all across the country in communities big and small. But our job as public health leaders is to ensure that these stories are more the norm than the exception. Now, I'm not putting all of this responsibility on you, I promise. I will share uh, in that responsibility, and that is part and really at the heart of the work that I have been doing since I began as Surgeon General. Last week, for example, we joined in our office with nonprofit leaders and private sector partners uh, to launch our call to action on walking and walkable communities. Now, you might initially think about walking as a rather dull topic. What does walking really have to do uh, with some of the complex challenges we're facing? But it turns out that walking may end up being one of the most powerful tools that we have for rolling back the tide on chronic diseases like diabetes uh, and heart disease. It also may be part of us reclaiming the culture of physical activity that we once had in America. Now, everyone in this room may understand that. But think about folks outside this room. You know, at a time when three out of 10 Americans live in communities that don't have adequate sidewalks, at a time when chronic illnesses like diabetes and uh, heart disease and cancer are responsible for seven out of 10 deaths in America and for over a trillion dollars uh, in healthcare costs, at a time like this, we have an opportunity, and I would even say a responsibility, uh, to ensure that people under, understand the facts about walking and physical activity. We have a duty to ensure, for example, that they know that just an average of 22 minutes a day of moderate physical activity can reduce your risk of heart disease and diabetes. And you can achieve this uh, through walking. Everywhere I have traveled, people have told me uh, that they were surprised at something so simple, something so fundamental like walking that we've been doing for millennia can have such a profound impact on one's health. But it's true. And what's also extraordinary is the diversity of partners uh, who came together and are working now hand in hand to bring this call to action to life. Partners who include the National Collegiate Athletic Association, Johnson & Johnson, and CEOs of other companies, the National Council of Shopping Centers, uh, as well as Kaiser Permanente. You know, people say it takes a village to create better health, and that's what we're trying to reflect uh, in our office. But we're also taking on other tough challenges as well. Earlier this year, I worked on uh, getting out into communities to talk about the importance of vaccinations, about the importance of ensuring that our vaccination rates are high. Sometimes when we make major breakthroughs, uh, we pull back and we assume that we'll just keep going forward in a positive direction. And when we developed uh, me uh, vaccinations like the measles vaccine, uh, many people felt, OK, now we can prevent those illnesses. The work is done. But as we saw in the measles uh, outbreak uh, that, uh, that took place in the United States uh, starting in December of last year, we can't uh, take our foot uh, off the gas when it comes to ensuring uh, that vaccination, vaccination rates are high. Because in too many communities across the country, vaccination rates have fallen dangerously low. And that allows illnesses like measles and others uh, to set foot uh, in our country and to do damage, uh, damage that could be avoided. We're also taking on uh, additional uh, issues as well, like the opiate uh, addiction epidemic, which I mentioned, as well as nutrition, mental health, and emotional well-being. And we're seeking to engage a variety of partners uh, in this effort and to think creatively about how we do this. Uh, and the vaccination effort, for example, we teamed up with Elmo uh, to get the message out about vaccinations, both to children and to parents. Um, Elmo, it turns out, is a remarkably effective messenger. <laughs> <laughs> and really quite spontaneous. He was a hysterical uh, person. I hope you guys get to meet him someday. But we've actually done a, a few collaborations with Elmo. And um, 
what always strikes me is that sometimes messengers who we think speak to one audience uh, invariably end up speaking to a much larger audience. Uh, and I heard from many parents uh, afterward who, who told me that, uh, parents who didn't have kids, by the way, uh, but uh, you know, hope to have kids one day, but uh, folks who said that they enjoyed watching the video and it made them rethink uh, their stance on vaccinations. So that's good. But through all of these initiatives, my goal as Surgeon General is to build a culture of prevention in America, a culture that's firmly rooted in active living, in healthy nutrition, and in emotional well-being. That's a culture that our country deserves. And it's a culture that also demands that we redefine what success means. Because too often we see success only as treatment done well. Or we see success as a model that was proven to be successful or a journal article that was submitted for publication. These are important, but they in and of themselves do not entirely constitute success. Ultimate success involves ensuring that our patients never have to walk through the door of our office or our hospital in the first place. That's real prevention. That's a community that's grounded in prevention. And I want us ultimately to be a nation that's as good at preventing disease as we are at treating it. That's the kind of success that we should be after. You know, we face big challenges in the end as a country. These challenges aren't new to all of you. You are public health professionals, and you read about these challenges every day in the headlines of newspapers and on the airwaves. But never ever believe that these challenges are bigger than the power of our collective will, because they are not. And if you ever doubt this, just remember that it was our collective will that allowed a small band of colonists to take on the largest empire at that time in the world and to build a foundation for what became one of the greatest countries uh, in civilization. It was collective will that also enabled our nation to face down unspeakable violence and racism and pass the Civil Rights Act uh, back in the 1960s. It was collective will that allowed the public health community and other communities across the country and the world to ultimately launch a campaign that eradicated smallpox, a feat that few thought possible at the time. That is the power of collective will. And the question that lies before all of us today is what kind of country do we want to build? What kind of world do we want to create with this collective will? Let us create a nation where every man, woman, and child has a fair shot at good health. Let us create a nation that opens doors of opportunity to all children, not just those born in the right neighborhoods, but also those who come to the United States from distant shores and those who also live in the forgotten corners of our country. Let us create a nation where health is seen clearly for what it is, as the foundation that makes everything else possible, the most valuable asset that our nation possesses. The world needs all of you, leaders in public health, who have dedicated your lives to making the country better. The world needs you to step up and to make this vision a reality. And I am proud to say that as your Surgeon General and as a proud alum of Yale, that it will be my pleasure and privilege to stand shoulder to shoulder with you as we seek to create this vision together. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for coming, and, and more than that, thank you for sketching out a vision of, of public health. I also think we should thank Howie, um, not mm -hmm. just for, for having you here, but, but also for what you do for, for the students. So I want to open this um, up for questions, and, and I'm going to sort of start one out. So, so raise your hand if you have a question, and, and uh, just say who you are, keep the questions brief. Um, if you're in one of the other rooms, you can actually tweet a question at SG at Yale, and we'll, <laughs> we'll do our best to, to read them. Um, and as you guys are thinking up questions, I'll, I'll start with one, which is, the last seven years have been focused on the policy of healthcare mm -hmm. and, and the wiring and, and the payments and coverage. How do we shift the conversation at a federal, state, and local level to think about public health? This is a good question. Uh, ultimately, there has been a great deal of focus on policy with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, with the implementation uh, of the law, as well as with other policy provisions that have been very important. But what we cannot let that obscure and as important as these policy provisions are, 
is the fact that health is ultimately determined and driven by what happens in communities. And if communities don't feel like they are partners in creating better health, uh, then we can never get to where we need to be. So that means that we have to go to communities and engage teachers and schools, that we have to engage uh, not only educators, but CEOs and employees and businesses, that we have to engage faith leaders and others and help them see the role uh, that they can play in improving health. What is imp interesting to me as I travel around the country and talk to sectors that are not traditionally engaged in health is that many of them are deeply affected by and concerned by the health challenges that we face. Uh, many of them know, for example, that if they are running a business and their employees are uh, saddled with chronic illnesses and are missing work a lot, that that affects their bottom line, it affects morale at work, uh, it affects the business that they're trying to build. Faith leaders uh, who are ultimately looking out for the well-being of their congregation realize uh, that mental illness uh, is a great burden for so many uh, of the families uh, in their community, uh, in part because many people don't feel comfortable uh, addressing mental illness because of the stigma still associated with it. So non-health related community leaders understand this, uh, but what they often don't know is what role they can play in helping to change that reality on the ground. And that's where I believe we have to shift and increase our focus as public health leaders. Because if you think about public health and, and jobs in public health as those which are solely limited uh, to researching specific program, programs and working at a desk in a department of public health, those are very, very important roles. We can't uh, lose those. We have to, in fact, strengthen those roles. But if, if you think that public health is only those things, then I think we, uh, we have missed the boat. Because what we have to realize is that public health now has to become a convening role is that public health has to be the force that enables people to see that health is the thread that runs through everything we do. And so the question of who is going to bring employers and faith leaders and the YMCAs and, uh, and others together to actually work on prevention initiatives, I think that the answer is public health leaders have to do that. So that's why uh, I would love to see more of our students, faculty members, public health experts um, out in communities helping to build these initiatives helping to teach people about the role that they can play, and then helping to work with them to build collaborations that make that a reality. Uh, that's the role that we need. And I will tell you from seeing examples of that around the country, that when it happens, that communities benefit. And the different partners are usually very grateful. Uh, and so one of the initiatives we're trying to build right now is a collaboration with faith leaders around mental health. Uh, we're also working with employers around physical activity. We'll be working with uh, employers on nutrition as well. There are people out there who are active and willing and ready to play a role in improving health, but they are waiting for your call, they're waiting for your direction, and waiting for your guidance. And that's where I think the future of public health lies. So questions? Um, I had a good question. Uh, regarding that kind of fatalistic mentality that you mentioned early uh, in, your, in your conversation. Um, so it, disproportionately, minority communities or communities of color have this fatalistic mentality in terms of their health. How is the Surgeon General's office engaging with other players and stakeholders to address the needs of these particular communities? It's, it's a good point. And what issue you bring up is really the issue of health equity and the idea that uh, we still experience uh, great inequities when it comes to health, where certain communities are uh, saddled with more of a burden uh, than others and have disproportionate rates of illness, uh, disproportionate access to treatment or lack of access to treatment in some cases. Part of what our office is doing uh, is to make health equity a cornerstone of each of our campaigns. So you'll notice, for example, in the call to action that we put out on walking, and it wasn't just telling people to walk, but very deliberately, uh, the focus of our report was walking and walkable communities, recognizing that many communities, particularly communities of color, as well as uh, folks who are living with disabilities, uh, do not have access uh, to do something as basic as walking. Uh, to do in a safe uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and reasonable way in their neighborhoods. And I realized this actually uh, early on because I remember uh, caring for patients uh, up in Boston at Brigham Women's Hospital uh, who we would often say, tell uh, you know, to take walks you know, as a way to just help burn some calories and get active if they were dealing with obesity or they're looking to prevent illness. And I remember one patient in particular uh, who, you know, we shared this advice with because she had I dealt with obesity for a long time, had developed diabetes, had a lot of chronic complications thereafter. Uh, and what people didn't realize until later is that for her, going for a walk outside 
was really the choice between getting exercise or taking the risk of getting mugged or shot. Uh, and when you face that kind of choice, then it's, uh, it's not an easy uh, decision. I mean, it's not a hard decision to make, really. You, you, know, you choose your safety uh, over the, what you perceive as a short-term benefit of your health. So our office is making health equity a cornerstone of each of our campaigns. But there's something else I think that we have to do collectively, which is that we need to ensure that there are uh, more uh, leaders from communities of color who are stepping into public health roles, who are represented in our workforce. The diversity of our workforce should reflect the diversity of the patients and the community members we are seeking to serve. That makes a very, very, very big difference. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you just a personal anecdote that Alice and I were just dealing with uh, this weekend. Uh, you know, we had a friend who called us uh, from, from New York, um, and uh, you know, she said, you know, this is essentially like my sister. Uh, her, her, fa her good friend, uh, his mother, had been admitted to the hospital uh, with bleeding from the gastrointestinal tract. And as some of you may know, uh, your blood counts are typically checked or tracked by hemoglobins or hematocrits. Uh, you know, a, a good hemoglobin might be somewhere in the range of 12 to 15, depending on if you're uh, a man or a woman. Uh, her hemoglobin, uh, two days prior to admission, uh, was, uh, was 10. Uh, then when she felt unwell, went to the hospital. It was rechecked just 48 hours later, and her hemoglobin had fallen to 7. And then it was rechecked again uh, when they were concerned that she was really bleeding a few hours later. Her hemoglobin had dropped to 5. This is an extraordinarily low level. And so as a physician, a nurse, as a healthcare provider, your immediate thought is, how do I get blood into my patient? Because in the short term, that's what they need. They need fluids, and I, you know, I, but ideally blood. But f even despite the fact that she was facing imminent death because the bleeding was continuing, she didn't want to get blood. In fact, she didn't want IV fluids. In fact, she didn't even want an IV. And when we asked why, uh, it turned out that she didn't trust the people who were taking care of her, not because they had done anything wrong, but because she was African-American and she felt that her community had been wronged uh, many times in the past and taken advantage of uh, by the medical and public health systems. And she didn't know what was going on and what they were trying to do to her. She worried that they were just trying to get her into surgery so they could make money. But distrust was at the root of that. And it took somebody coming in uh, who said very, very much similar things, but who understood her background, who understood her experiences, uh, who came from her community. It took a messenger like that to actually convince her uh, that it was important for her to get the blood. And eventually she did, uh, and she responded well to it. But this is just one example of how uh, the diversity of our workforce uh, has an important impact on the treatment that we're ultimately able to deliver. Because the best of science and practice uh, is sometimes insufficient uh, to overcome barriers of trust and diversity matters there. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. Um, my question is on uh, under vaccination in America, particularly in California where pri uh, relatively children in public and private schools are, uh, compared to the rest of the country, are under vaccinated and you see exemptions are much higher uh, rates than other parts of the country. And so while I believe education is a long-term good thing that we should do, uh, I guess from your experience traveling across the country and talking to people, what are the biggest uh, short-term and long-term challenges to raising vaccination rates, um, the approaches that you think can address them, and I guess how can we approach people who are generally good people that have concerns about uh, vaccinating their kids and the tension, underlying tension about individual liberty and social good mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, centers around this debate. It's a good question. Uh, the vaccine debate is an important one because it actually has implications for many other topics that we're discussing as a country where we wrestle with this, where the line between individual liberties and collective responsibility comes in. But I will say when it comes to that line, that we have made a decision in many other cases that we value collective good uh, over individual decision making, especially in cases where individual decisions affect a community. And that is the case with vaccinations, that we know when a family makes a decision not to vaccinate their child, 
uh, that they are not just putting their child at risk, but they are putting other children at risk around them. And take measles, for example. We know uh, that even that some people who get the measles vaccine just don't respond to it. The measles vaccine, if you get both doses of it, confers a 97% protection rate. But there are 3% of people uh, who will still be vulnerable if they're exposed to measles through no wrongdoing of their own. There are also people uh, who may have com compromised immune systems who cannot get vaccinated and who are also vulnerable uh, to, being, to exposure. These people rely on us uh, to ensure that we are vaccinated uh, so that we protect them as well. One of the most important things we can do to improve vaccination rates is to raise our voice as public health professionals. Because one of the biggest problems we have is that the volume of our voices is way too low. Like, who are policymakers hearing from when it comes to making decisions on vaccines? I don't think they're usually hearing from public health professionals who are dialing in to their office and keeping their phones off the hook with the importance and urgency of public health. In fact, far too often I find that medical and public health professionals uh, don't think that they can have a real impact on policy decisions. So just out of curiosity, how many people here have ever called uh, an elected leader to share an opinion, a member of Congress, a state legislator? Okay, so maybe about a quarter uh, of people here. So that's good, and I'm, I'm glad that you have. Um, next time I come back to campus, I would love if everyone raised their hand. <laughs> And the reason is because legislators need to hear from you. Um, some people, when you read the paper, you sometimes think, well, legislators and folks in D.C. or in state houses, that they're just very, you know, their politicians are very calculating. They don't really care about like, the impact. They're thinking about political decisions. I have found that is not the case. Uh, many, I've had the, the great privilege of working with and meeting with uh, many elected leaders. And what I find is many of them are there because they want to improve health for the community. They understand politics and have to contend with it. Uh, but a lot of times, they also don't have information uh, about what uh, the, public, the public health implications are of policy uh, options that are on the table. And that's where you come in. Uh, you, know, you can be a powerful force for education. The work that I did before I came to uh, this office was centered around mobilizing physicians uh, to be educators, to be uh, leaders in sharing public health messages with, uh, with uh, elected leaders. Uh, and each and every time they did that, they were received warmly uh, because people you know, didn't hear very often from public health professionals. So I think that that's a powerful thing that we can do uh, to help improve policy around this. I think what you saw in California, uh, what you've seen in states across the country, is that more and more states are re-examining uh, their exemption laws. They're looking at how to uh, strike that balance uh, between individual liberty and public health, but in a way that does, does not do a disservice to those folks who are vulnerable. Uh, California was able to strengthen its laws, uh, and other states are looking to do the same. But we can accelerate uh, progress on this by having more uh, public health leaders speak up and call their elected officials. I'm going to actually ask you a question from Twitter, from, yeah, from Pulp me. Operita. And Carmen Slam Diego, silly, silly names, but but good questions. And and what they're trying to ask is, you know, outside of health, what role do public health professionals play in areas like climate change and gun violence and vehicular mm -hmm. mortality? You know, wh how wide is the net we should cast? The net is wide because all of those things actually in involve health. Climate change has health impacts. Gun violence has health impacts. There's so many things which housing uh, has a, an impact on health. Uh, the kind of transportation that's available in your community has an impact on whether people are physically active or not and whether they're safe or not. Something that's especially important at a time where we lose nearly 5,000 people like a year due to pedestrian accidents and injure near over 66,000 more. So all of these things we don't traditionally think of as being related to health, but they are. And that's actually why the net for public health professionals of this generation and future generations has to be wide. Now, when you initially go out there, there are people who will say, stay in your lane. Don't focus on issues that are, are, are not public health related. And that's why it's your responsibility and our collective responsibility as public health leaders to help people to see that our lane is wide. So wide, in fact, that it encompasses most other lanes. And that's why we have to be conveners and coordinators in helping other sectors understand how they can work together with us to improve public, public health broadly. Because lastly, I'll say this. There are a certain amount of things that we can do, like in, uh, you know, in our clinics and hospitals. There are certain things that we can do uh, through our public health programs. Um, but the amount of benefit that we can get 
if we, for example, uh, move towards smoke-free housing, uh, the amount of benefit that we can get if we build and plan cities in ways that make physical activity easier uh, and actually more enjoyable, the amount of gain that we can get if we work with employers to make small changes in the workplace, which can improve, improve nutrition and physical activity, these are big, big gains. And this is where I think the big gains are in public health that we need to go after. Another question? Hi. Um being an agent for change, but also feeling powerless at the same time. Hmm. After hearing your talk just now, I personally feel inspired. But um, I want to ask you more about how do individuals and communities, even when they may feel the inspiration, combat against greater forces? For example, many corporations out there make profits off tobacco, fast food. How exactly do you see that battle playing out? Well, it's a good, good question, and thank you for, for your comment as well. Uh, the question of how to restore a sense of power and agency to individuals when it comes to health is the great challenge that faces our country right now. I believe it's bigger than the challenge we face in any individual disease group. Because if we can, if we can enable people to reconnect with their power and with their sense of agency, then they can do extraordinary things in their community. The place where you can start often uh, is, as I mentioned earlier, by sharing your opinions and your ideas and your observations with elected leaders. But when you're facing big forces, big industry that you think may not listen to you, that's where the power of collective will comes in. And that's why we have the power, even though we may think we're one individual, what can we do? The thing that you have to remember is you're not just one individual. But for every person who speaks up about, a, about an issue, there are often many more who are out there who feel the same thing and who are looking for a leader who will bring them together to be, enable them to raise their collective voices. And you can be that leader. When I was 17 years old, my sister and I uh, began our first nonprofit organization. We were freshmen in college. We had no clue really what we were doing. But we were excited about the, and about the idea of addressing HIV, which we saw as a growing problem uh, at that time in India and then certainly, of course, in the United States. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we were excited by the possibility of creating some change. We knew we couldn't do it alone. So we brought a few folks together uh, who understood uh, what we were trying to do, who shared similar values. They were students like us. And what enabled us to build an operation that ultimately educated tens of thousands of students uh, and that changed the career trajectories of many folks along the way, what enabled us to do that was building collective will was bringing people together, was recognizing that we don't have to be sole actors in life, but that our role can be uh, conveners, and that by doing so, it's not only good for the community, but we give other people who are often struggling with a sense uh, you know, of disempowerment, we give them an opportunity to step up and make a difference as well. So those are the kind of leaders that I think you need to be. Um, that's the power of what you can create through collective will. And when you do that, history tells us time and time again that small groups of passionate people who believe in what they're doing and are not willing to give up can overcome extraordinary obstacles and can create incredible change. That's the history of our country. That's the legacy uh, of public health. That's a legacy that you are moving forward. Uh, and that's why I think uh, that's what's going to enable us, I believe, to create this golden era of public health that we really need. Final question. Here, let, we'll pass the microphone over to you. In answering a lot of your questions, you spoke a lot about um, like historic wrongdoings and the mistrust that, that builds within communities. Um, and you've also spoken about issues of neglect, issues of access to safe communities, to, to, to health facilities. Um, but how do we address uh, issues that are not just historic and not just passive, but actually active? Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about issues of police violence in communities of color. I'm thinking about issues of HIV criminalization. Um, to what extent um, can the state address these issues within themselves, and how can we assist as public health students, as public health professionals, um, in kind of guiding away from these policies that actively produce negative health outcomes? What I would say is that you don't need to just assist the state, but you need to lead the state in doing that. You think about uh, violence in communities. Right? There 
are measures that citizens can take to work with law enforcement to build safer communities. There are dialogues that citizens coming together can actually start with law enforcement about how to create better relationships uh, you know, between the residents of the neighborhoods and those who are trying to keep it safe. Um, we can start these dialogues, and they don't require an act of Congress. They don't require legislation. Nobody needs to give us, as public health leaders, permission to start dialogues. But that is the power of what you can do. Because there's a danger here when we look at some of these issues um, as they're covered. Because the way that issues like police violence and others get covered are such that we sometimes see the most extreme cases. But we can also generalize too easily and assume that every person uh, believes uh, what the worst possible person out there believes. We can believe that every law enforcement officer out there uh, doesn't care about minorities and is looking to use excessive force. That is not true. There are many, many law enforcement officials in this country who wake up and go to work every day with the best of intentions, who do their jobs well, uh, and, and many who come from communities of color uh, that have been affected. So we have to be careful about generalizing. And we have to, if we, do, if we are careful about that, that also gives us the opportunity to partner with people who are doing it right, to hold them up as examples of how doing this uh, the right way, of policing communities, of partnering with communities, is possible. It's not just uh, theoretical. Because if you think about what we elevate uh, in our public discourse, we tend to elevate what is wrong. We tell, to, uh, tend to elevate the examples that depict our failings. What we can do as public health leaders is to elevate the examples of where we get it right. We can elevate those voices, and we can strengthen the dialogue that takes place between the folks who are getting it right and their communities. And that's where I think we can be leaders in it. It could be something as simple as, as a public health leader convening a town hall meeting uh, with law enforcement uh, and members of the community. It could be something as simple as sitting down with law enforcement as a public health leader to talk about the problems and understand what law enforcement in your community is doing to, to try to address uh, you know, the concerns of the community. Everything starts often with a simple step. That's what Lao Tzu said, right? He said the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Uh, and that's what, as public health leaders, we can do is take that step. And when we take that step, then we, we not only make a step toward progress, but we give other people permission to take a step as well. That's what leadership is about, and that's what I think you can do as well. What, a, what an extraordinary way to end. So I think that, that all that's left is, is thanking you for, for an amazing talk, an amazing inspiration, and, and for joining us. So can we join me in, in thanking you? Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.